This is a video about what it means for a function f to be Riemann integrable on a closed interval from a to b. So we'll just start right off with that definition. So if you haven't watched the first video that I made on this about partitions and about Riemann sums, you should go look there for some of the notations and conventions that we'll use. Okay, so if I've got a function on this closed interval, so my function's f on this interval from a to b, we're gonna say it's Riemann integrable on that interval if the following happens. So there exists some real number l such that for every epsilon, there should exist a delta, so maybe for every positive number epsilon, there should exist a number delta that's also positive, and delta is allowed to depend on epsilon, such that if p dot is any tagged partition of this interval a, b, whose norm is smaller than this delta here, then the Riemann sum of f corresponding to that partition p dot minus l should be less than epsilon. So if my partition has subintervals whose lengths are all smaller than this number delta, then we're saying that the Riemann sum should be within epsilon of this number l. So let's talk about some notation before we start playing around with using that definition and getting used to it. So number one, instead of this L here, we've probably had a calculus class if you're watching this video, we typically denote that, uh, that number by this kind of elongated S. Of course, it's an integral sign from A to B. Again, those are the endpoints of the interval we're talking about of F. Or alternatively, you could put F of X DX. Just note that there's nothing special about that X there. So if it was F of U DU or F of T DT, fine, who cares? So nothing's really special about X. Second note, so the set of all Riemann integrable functions on this interval from A to B has notation. It's kind of this fancy R uh, next to this interval A, B here. And so um, another way to look at what some of the stuff that we're studying is um, I've got the set of all functions. And we studied the set of continuous functions on an interval from A to B. And we had a lot of theorems that told us what are some properties we could expect of those functions. And so what we're going to do is um, develop some more properties of these functions that are Riemann integrable. So in other words, we're going to talk about what are the properties of functions that live in this set. And another thing that we'll look at is what are some of the relationships between the set of Riemann integrable functions and the set of continuous functions? Can we say one's a subset of the other? Kinds of questions like that. All right, so in particular, just to get used to this notation here, again, if f is Riemann integrable on this interval from a to b, then we could say f is an element of that set. So that's how you'd use that. And so if you see that in a textbook, it's just trying to say you can take the Riemann integral of this function on a, b. And just to, you know, if you've had a calculus class, I'm sure you've integrated something. Yes, this is the same integral that we're talking about. But for right now, since we're developing it, we're going to pretend that we don't know any of those rules from calculus, which if you haven't had calculus in a long time, maybe that's not too hard to do. But pretend that you know nothing else about the Riemann integral right now besides this definition right here. So let's look at maybe the first result in order to get used to playing with that definition. If f's a Riemann integrable function on AB, then the value of the integral is uniquely determined. In other words, it should just be one number. It's not possible if there's two numbers. And that should kind of sound like uh, something we had for limits, right? If a function has a limit, there's just one limit. There's not two. It's unique. Anyway, so how would you prove this? So let's suppose that I had L and L, L prime and L double prime. And let's say they both satisfy the above definition. And you're like, what above definition are you talking about? I'm talking about this wonderful thing up here. So uh, L prime satisfies all this good stuff with epsilon and any tag partition whose mesh is small enough. And similarly, L double prime also satisfies that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write both of those out. So let's let epsilon be any positive number. So there exists delta prime, which of course you could guess is gonna to correspond to L prime here, such that if P dot one is any tag partition of AB whose norm is less than delta prime, then the Riemann sum of F on P dot one minus L prime should be less than epsilon over two. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply the definition above to L double prime as well. So similarly, there should exist a delta double prime that's greater than zero, such that um, if, this should be if right here, sorry, but if P dot two is any tag partition of AB whose norm, or I might say mesh sometimes, is less than delta double prime, then you guessed it, the Riemann sum should be within epsilon over two of L double prime. And now I think that you probably see what to do. I'm gonna look at the difference between L prime and L double prime uh, for any partition whose norm is smaller than the minimum of these two that I've defined, delta prime and delta double prime. So in other words, if delta is a number smaller than both of those, then I get all this good stuff at once, is one way to think about that. So for any tag partition whose norm is smaller than both of them, 
we see the difference between L prime and N minus. So the difference between L prime and L double prime. I'm gonna do this sneaky trick where I add and subtract the Riemann sum of my function on a partition whose norm is smaller than delta. And then now what we're gonna do is this old trick. You've seen me do it many times into the videos if you've been watching. We're gonna split this up with the triangle inequality into this piece plus this piece. And when I do that, why is that good? Well, because P dot is smaller than delta, therefore I get to use both of these assumptions here, that each of these individually are smaller than epsilon over two. Therefore, the difference between L prime and L double prime is less than epsilon. Now, since epsilon was arbitrary, we showed that L prime and L double prime are arbitrarily close to each other, therefore they are equal. So there is only one such value of a Riemann integral. Now let's do like a concrete example of computing an integral, the value of an integral with this kind of hard definition. So if you've got a function from zero three to the real numbers, and let's say it's this piecewise function, it's two if you're on zero one, and it's three if you're on one to three. And there's a picture of it. So based on the graph, I would guess that the value of the integral here should be eight. So how did I get that? Well, I see that uh, this area here is two, right? Since it's one times two, whereas this interval here would be three times two, which is six. Therefore, the total area of those rectangles would be eight. So that's where that's coming from. What I wanna do is I wanna justify that and make sure everything clicks with the epsilon definition. So how do we show that? And so what we're gonna do is a bunch of scratch work just to find the delta, and you'll see that the delta depends on epsilon in a very nice way for this problem. But these are maybe a lot harder, in my opinion, to do than like a continuity proof or, or some of the limit proofs that we've been used to doing so far in this class. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna explore what happens. Let's say that we've got a delta in a partition whose norm is less than that delta there. So what else do we notice about f? Well, f is two or three, depending on if it's in the first subinterval from zero to one, or if it's in the second subinterval here from a, from a one to three. I should be careful when I say subinterval. I, um, I'm not saying that this partition p dot has two subintervals. I'm just saying f is really determined by either of these two. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a subset of our partition. So I haven't drawn you the partition yet. Just theoretically think that you've chopped this interval up here into a bunch of teeny tiny subintervals. And what we're gonna do is we're going to gather the ones who have tags in zero one, and then we're gonna gather the ones who have tags from one to three, since those determine what value my function has, two or three. And I'll draw you a picture too that I think will make that a little bit more clear. So p dot one is all the subintervals of my partition whose tags lie in zero one, and p dot two is all the subintervals of my partition whose tags lie in one to three. And so here's my picture down here. I think this is a better picture where if I zoom in a little bit for you here. So in those green ones there, those are there's looks like one, so what am I counting so you can see? One, two, three subintervals here whose tags lie in zero, one, right? Those green dots or this kind of turquoise teal dots lie in zero, one. Whereas, look, uh, starting here to here, right? His tag is to the right of one. Therefore, he would be a part of P2. So all of these subintervals this way are part of P2. So what I'm saying is I can split the whole partition into these two subgroups or these two subsets, P.1 and P.2. And another thing to notice in this picture, that if I was to um, take the Riemann sum over the whole partition, that would be just the Riemann sum over the partition P.1 plus the Riemann sum over the uh, subset P.2. So that's the next thing I'm gonna write down. So the Riemann sum over the whole partition should just be the ones who have tags in zero, one, plus the one who have tags in one to three. Those are our only options. So what we're gonna do now is let u1 be the union of all the subintervals in p1. So the union of all subintervals whose tags are between zero and one. The first thing I claim is that this interval from zero to one minus delta is contained in u1. And so to see this, remember delta is defined to be like uh, bigger than the length of any subinterval in my partition. So to prove this subset inclusion though, let's say you've got u that is in zero to one minus delta. So in particular though, u is somebody that just lives in my partition. I'm not saying it lives in p.1. If you have a copy of Bartle and Sherbert, that is a typo, that should just be p. Dot. So it lives in sub, sub interval of your partition. I'll call it xk minus one xk, but not necessarily in p.1 again, just in my partition. 
But what else do I know? Well, I know that the length of any subinterval in the partition is smaller than delta. So that means that the length of the subinterval has to be less than delta. And what we're going to do is play around with that. What else do I know? Well, I know that if u has to, maybe I should highlight this, u belongs to this subinterval. Well, that means u has to be to the right of xk minus 1. So that's all this says here. But then what else? Uh, well, that means that uh, that should be less than 1 minus delta in this case. How come I know that? Well, because I picked u to be in here. So this says that u has to be to the left of 1 minus delta, which is what this says here. Now, what else do I know? I know that xk has to be less than or equal to xk minus 1 plus delta. How do I know that? Uh, that comes from rearranging this inequality right here. Really, I should probably have an equal to here. It's, it's possible they could be equal. So please change that. That should probably be an equal, less than or equal to. So this bottom line just comes again from rearranging this part. And so what do I know though? xk minus 1 plus delta, that should be less than, uh, well, xk minus 1 it's less than 1 minus delta. So I'll just plug that information in right here, and then I just copied and pasted this delta right here. And why is that kind of cool? Well, because the deltas cancel out, and you just get 1 there. So then what's the point? What do I have? That says that xk is it to the, to the left, or maybe is equal to 1. So therefore, this is some interval in my partition that is to the, that, you know, at worst it goes to the right 1, and so what I'm trying to say is that the tag for this partition, it can't go farther than xk, therefore it can't go farther than 1. So tk has to be before 1. So what I'm trying to emphasize is that this has a tag that is in the interval from 0 to 1, but remember those were the conditions to be in p.1. So what did we just show? We just showed that u is an element of this interval, which is an element of p.1. Therefore u belongs to u1 the union of all such intervals whose tag is in the interval from 0 to 1. So that's one inclusion. Similarly, we could show that u1 is a subset of this interval from 0 to 1 plus delta. So let's just see how would this go. So to see this, uh, if u is in u1, remember u1 is the union of all intervals uh, whose tags are in 0, 1, then uh, that says that there exists some subinterval in p.1 such that well, u is in that subinterval. So by way of contradiction, suppose that xk minus delta is less than or equal to 1. So what would happen in that case? Let me show you why that's false, and then you'll see why this is useful if you don't see it already. So if I just kind of rewrite, rearrange that, it says 1 is less than or equal to xk minus delta. Well, that is less than or equal to xk minus. Remember, delta is like the biggest length of a subinterval. So then I'm taking more away here than I am here, right? That's this on the right is smaller than delta. Therefore, I'm taking less away right here. So that's why this side's bigger. That's why this is bigger. And so what happens though? I just get xk minus 1. And so wait a minute though. xk minus 1, that is to the left of 1, right? I assume that this was a subinterval who had a tag in 0, 1. Well, that means that this left endpoint can't go uh, to the past of 1. Can't go past 1. So 1 is less than 1 is ridiculous. That's a contradiction. Therefore, this can happen. The opposite has to be true. The opposite of that would be that uh, xk is less than or equal to 1 plus delta. Uh, therefore, u minus delta should be less than or equal to xk minus delta, right? Since u is to the left of xk is what this says up here. And I know that I just justified that that's less than 1. So finally, why is that cool? Just take this delta, add it over to this side and you get u is less than 1 plus delta. Therefore, u is in this interval, and I've shown this inclusion as well. Now, altogether, what did we just show? We just show that u1 contains this interval from 0 to 1 minus delta, but it is contained inside of the interval from 0 to 1 plus delta. Notice that the left interval has length 1 minus delta. Notice that u1, each tag in u1, was picked so that the tag lies in 0, 1, and if I think about how is my function defined, well, my function was defined so that if it's in this interval from 0 to 1, its value is 2. So the value of f at the tag is 2, is what this is trying to say. And then finally, what's this thing's length? Its length is 1 plus delta. So let's think about the Riemann sum. What can we say about it? Well, I know that the actual Riemann sum for my function on this portion, on the uh, Intervals whose tags line 0, 1 has to be between 2 times 1 minus delta, but it also has to be uh, at most 2 times 1 plus delta. So think about this as like one big rectangle, and think about this as one big rectangle. And I'm saying that the sum of all the individual rectangles 
uh, that should have height too, should be between these here. Similarly, we could do the same kind of arguments for P.2. And so we could show that U2, which would be the union of all the subintervals in the big partition whose tags lie from one to three, satisfies a similar inequality, where in this case though, um, U2 should be between one plus delta to three and one minus delta to three. So maybe what I should say, U2 contains this interval, whereas U2 is contained inside of this interval. So similar arguments to the above would show that. And we'll keep going in a similar fashion. Notice that this interval has length two minus delta, Remember that U2 is the union of subintervals of uh, P dot uh, with tags in one three, where the value of my function is three. So that's all I'm saying to you here. And so uh, also the length of this interval would be two plus delta. And that's the next line that I think I write down. So again, I wanna talk about, well, what can I say about the Riemann sum then uh, for um, when I evaluate on these subintervals? Well, that says that uh, in this case, the Riemann sum on these subintervals, whose tags lie from one to three, should be between three times two minus delta and three times two plus delta. Again, think about this, these two things as like two big rectangles that kind of give me an idea about how bad the sum of these little rectangles could be. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add. And what are we gonna add? We're gonna add this uh, top one, well, yeah, is it that one? Yeah, we're gonna add this inequality, that string of inequalities, to this string of inequalities. And what that looks like is right here, and you're like, what do you mean you're gonna add them? I mean, I'm just gonna straight up add them. I'm gonna add these two sides together, the middles together, and these two sides together. And then I know when I add these things together, I should still get the same inequalities. And when I do that, when you add these up, that should be eight minus five delta. Remember, the Riemann sums on P dot one plus the Riemann sum on P dot two, that's just the Riemann sum at P dot, right? I split P dot into these two pieces. So when I put them back together, when I add them up, I should get the whole thing back. And then finally on this side, this would be eight plus five delta. So now what we'll do is we'll rewrite this. Instead of as this compound inequality, we'll write it as an absolute value inequality. That says that the Riemann sum is within five delta of eight. And therefore I see if I really want this less than epsilon at the end of the day, I should make epsilon, I'm sorry, I should make delta less than epsilon over five. So delta should be less than epsilon over five. And so that would be um, where you'd start with like a more formal proof about how to prove that the integral of that function is equal to eight on that interval.